Hello and welcome. I'm Michelle Paver and we're going out live on my Facebook page. Uh, and this is also going to be available on my YouTube channel. Uh, that's youtube.com slash C slash Michelle Paver author. And you can keep up to date with me on Twitter at twitter.com slash Michelle Paver. Um, well, this month we've got a lot happening this month. Uh, I'll be talking very shortly live to two really lovely fans, um, boyfriend and girlfriend, who found each other through Wolf Brother. Um, and I'll also, also be tackling lots of questions that you've sent in since last month. And I'll, I'll be recommending a film and a book that you might enjoy over the holiday season. Um, but first, it's just a quick canter through some of the things that you've been saying on social media. Ah, uh, yes, Dan Wood has a suggestion for a location for dark matter. I think that's, yeah, absolutely gorgeous, Dan. Um, Odds Book Skins, um, interesting book club name. They're having a, I think it's tomorrow, yeah, somewhere on a pub just on the South Bank talking about thin air. Lovely. Uh, there's a lovely teacher called Scooby Sue who's been doing some amazing things with Wolf Brother, including she's got a river on her ceiling with the hidden people. Um, fantastic. Monmouth School, um, I'm really pleased about this. Monmouth Girls School has been discussing dark matter. Um, lovely to hear that you've been enjoying that. And then we've got something really far out. Trassel 24 has Scythian tattoos. Um, this was following on from my um, visit to the marvellous British Museum exhibition. That's on until January the 14th. I do recommend you go um, if you haven't already, if you can, if you're in the country. And then Joel... Um, He's been, he read Dark Matter five years ago and as uh, enjoying thin air. Um, oh, yes, you read Dark Matter in the Caribbean. Fantastic. <laughs> and it still chilled you. So pleased. Um, which brings me to the next one. Um, I, I was up in the Outer Hebrides for a book festival a little while ago, and there's been some tweeting about um, the place names, the Norse place names. And there's also a picture of me. I think I tweeted a picture of me with... Um, uh, a wonderful climber called um, uh, Doug Scott, who actually climbed Kanchenjunga in 1979 uh, without supplemental oxygen. Um, and that was great. And that's in front of a megalith, um, the Kalanish stones. And actually, just before that photo was taken, Doug was sort of looking at it and analysing how he how he could climb that, that megalith <laughs> in about sort of 30 seconds flat, I should think, even in his 70s, he'd be able to do it. So that was that was a, a great day for me to um, to meet him, somebody who actually has climbed Kanchenjunga. There's also one from Libby. Um, this may take some explaining. If you haven't been following Twitter, Alaric is the name of um, a spider who lives on my stairs. And I'm scared of spiders, so, you know, I've given him a name and it helps because I'm no longer scared of him. So she, he'd gone missing for a while and she's suggesting he's... It's kind of the thing he would do, actually. Yep. The next one is from Pacha Muchka. Um, wonderful name, who was so terrified of dark matter that you put him, put it under a cushion. Um, I love that. So you couldn't see it lurking there. I'm really pleased I scared you, Pachamuchka. And then we're back to Scooby Sue, um, the wonderful teacher in Somerset, who's been having this amazing get together uh, for Wolf Brother, including tracking and marshmallows. And finally, we've got a great one from Carla showing off her tattoo her Wolf Brother Tattoo Chronicles tattoo, which really looks amazing. Um, obviously, kids, don't go for a tattoo. Um, you know, you want to only do that if you're an adult, but I think that's absolutely gorgeous. So thank you for that. Um, that's the sort of media, uh, social media roundup. But now we're into the, the sort of the main part, which is Ask Michelle Anything. Not quite sure we've got a kitten there, but <laughs> that's fine. Um so what we're going to do now, um, the first part of the, I mean, I'll be coming to all the questions that you've posted this one um, shortly, but now we're going to do something rather special because we've got two fans here. Kieran got in touch a while ago and he's been a fan for a long time and he actually met um, his current girlfriend, his very much current girlfriend, Charlie, through the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness because they both love them. And he said, needless to say, I fell in love. Isn't that brilliant? And brings me to the, my question, 
Um, and the question Kieran had was, since we've been dating for two years, this January, uh, I've always given Charlie a gift to do with Chronicles of Ancient Darkness. And he gave a copy of Wolf Brother, um, and then he adopted in her name Torak, the Wolf, the Wolf Conservation Trust. But now, what he'd really like is for me to say hello to Charlie. Um, and he, he then ended up by saying, "If you're not able to respond, I would still like to say thank you. I found the love of my life thanks to you, and you gave two awkward children a world they could escape to, a world that years later would bring them together." <laughs> Well, I can do better than just say hello to Charlie. Hello, Charlie. I know, I know, but it is pretty cool, isn't it? I mean, that is that is so lovely. Um, so, hello, Charlie, and hello, Kieran. This is, I mean, we have, obviously, we've had a little chat beforehand to make sure that we can link up. Um, I know you've got some questions for me, um, but can I just ask one that I've been dying to ask? And, you know, how did both of you get to know Wolf Brother? To, can you remember that? Because I know you're, you know, you're in your twenties and you're at university and all the rest of it. But can you remember how you first heard of it or came across it? Do you want to go first? Charlie? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, for me, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, I have this great great aunt who traditionally always buys us books for Christmas. Some way off the mark. Some perfectly hit them. And it was. Just by chance, she went in, she heard that I liked wolves, and she said, it's got a wolf on the cover, it's got a wolf in the title, give it a go. <laughs> I, yeah. I just fell in love. I read it in about a week. <laughs> it must wow. have been. And I struggled with reading when I was younger, so it was gone. And after that, my parents didn't hear the end of it. I needed every new book as quickly <laughs> as possible. <laughs> uh, yeah. Gosh. And, and what what about you, Kieran? Oh, yeah, I can remember mine. So uh, the library in my, my school was weird. We moved half the um, middle school, got moved over to the high school. And in the first year, year seven, there was like a really small like cabin for the library. And that one of the only posters on the walls was for Soul Eater. And I loved the ah. artwork on it. Yeah, I yes. really loved the yes. artwork on it. So that's it's the and she was like yeah this isn't the first one you want to read this one first so then I pretty much read all of the books one after another in no time at all and then became very obsessed with getting them to pre-order all the new ones that's that's fantastic I mean as you can everyone can tell who's listening to this you are two exceptionally bright people with hugely wonderful taste in literature of course uh, <laughs> which is why you enjoyed <laughs> Chronicles so much do you have Charlie do you have a question or that you've been wanting to ask is there anything that that you'd particularly like to ask I think my biggest question since I first read the book was why wolves because I was always sort of told I was weird for it was always growing up they're the bad guys aren't they they're the big bad wolf yeah. and it was very refreshing to have a beautiful illustration of wolves so why why did you yeah. choose to go with wolf? oh you know that that is a great question um strangely enough I mean apart from Little Red Riding Hood I didn't grow up thinking they were the bad guys because um, my dad gave me this brilliant book called um, Once Long Ago, which had stories um, from all around the world um, in which Native American, Japanese, Chinese, Africa, everywhere. And um, the first story in the book is called The Boy and the Wolves, and it's a Native American story. And it's about how this little boy is, he's, he's actually left in the snow by his rather nasty older brother. And this appealed to me because I had an older sister who was not nasty, but, you know, um, and then he's looked after by wolves. And so I guess, I mean, that is one of many stories, but that was probably my first encounter with wolves, really. And so, and then in the, the Jungle Book, you know, Mowgli is, is looked after by wolves. So I kind of came from it, came to it, you know, thinking, well, I really like wolves. So when I was 10, I was obsessed with them and I wanted them. I wanted a wolf. You know, why can't I have a wolf? We live near Wimbledon Common. Why can't I have a wolf? No, you can't have a wolf. <laughs> Here's a spaniel um, who was gorgeous, you know, sort of took him for walks and things on the Common, but he was 
became a wolf in my imagination. Um, so it was always wolves. And I think probably, you know, I forgot about that in a sense because I was older and grown up when I, I started to write Wolf Brother. But, you know, what you love as a child sometimes comes back. And so, you know, it just seemed natural to have – it was kind of wish fulfillment in a way, you know, give Torak a wolf. Um, and also for, for technical storytelling reasons, you know, wolves, as I, I – I kind of discovered very early on in the story that actually it's great having a wolf as a as a companion because they're so clever, um, they're really strong, you know, they've got incredibly strong jaws, um, wonderful sense of smell, uh, senses, you know, so actually it, it helps Torak out of a lot of tricky situations. So that, that in a technical sense helps, but that's not the reason. It's because I loved them um, as a kid. Um, so, yeah. That's why. <laughs> oh, that's a great question. I'm, I'm, I hope that goes some way to answering it. Um, Kieran, do you? <laughs> Thank you. So, Kieran, do you have a um, a, a question, one, perhaps? Uh, so, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, so, what did you do for the preparing, writing, thin air, and dark matter? How did you make that atmosphere so creepy? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, well, Dark Matter uh, was sort of partly inspired by a trip I'd taken without thinking of ghosts, but I'd, I'd gone round, sailed round Spitsbergen in the summer. And so I'd been there in the, you know, the, the midnight sun. And um, I'd seen these sort of very remote trappers' huts, all the remains of them, and, and taken loads of notes, because I always take notes whenever I'm travelling. Um, but then when I was actually okay, now, you know, I'd worked up a story and I want to set it in the, the polar night and everything. Um, I read lots in the British Library and I found this, of sort of accounts of early expeditions, and I found this great 1935, I think, expe expedition. So I, you know, did a lot of work on that. But then I had to go back, which was great, um, to Spitsbergen in the polar night. Um, and I chose a time, I think it was the sort of end of November, beginning December. So it's, you know, the sun is completely below the horizon, but you get this sort of weird false dawn when it's sort of, you don't see the sun, darts to get light, and then it gets dark again. So the sun is just sort of nearly near the horizon and then down again. And then the moon was sort of full, but so far north that it was circling, you know, it never, never sets. So it was a very weird week because it was completely dark and then got slightly light. And, and then I sort of, went snowshoeing with um, a husky and um, someone with a large gun, because you have to, because there are polar bears everywhere. Um, um, so, the, you know, that just completely made dark matter, because uh, until, until you actually, you know, you go into a, a, a cabin in the dark, having been snowshoeing along a valley to get there, and it's dark and cold in the cabin, because obviously they can't leave any fires, you know, you, you don't realise how creepy it is, just the sound of your waterproofs and things it's um so that just being there you know that's what helps and in the same way with thin air you know i did loads of research on the the mountains and the, the expeditions and the mountaineers but then actually climbing doing that the, the not the climb i didn't climb kanchenjunga i'm not a mountaineer but um camping you know at thirteen thousand feet and then you have a blizzard and you're in your tent alone and there's the thunder and lightning and the snow um, then you hear footsteps outside, you know, what is it? Um, there's nothing like that. Um, I have a waterproof notebook because, you know, my, my notes are sort of practically illegible, but that's, that's how you, I think you really get it. I hope atmospheric, um, I hope, you know, it makes you feel that you're there. Um, so yeah, basically doing as much as you can of what, what your characters do. Um, sorry, Charlie, you were going to say something. I was just saying, definitely, definitely very atmospheric. Oh, good. Excellent. <laughs> Have you got a, another question, Charlie? Um, I think another big one I'm always, particularly about Chronicles, is um, you were always a bit of an inspiration to me because you were an author who went out and actually, like you were just saying, you lived it. You did what your character yeah. did a bit, you you know, to yeah. the extent that you can when you're writing about Torak and Ren, but... Yes, I just yes. again, what what made you decide to make that bold move and just go? Well, 
I'm going to go and do it rather than just research it, pick up some books, yeah. Google a bit. But yeah, what what encouraged you to, to take that step? Do you know, no one has ever asked me that. It's brilliant. I, I love being <laughs> asked questions that I've not asked before. Um, and, and I think it actually was serendipity. I mean, I wish, I mean, I had done a bit, quite a lot of hands-on research for my earlier book. I'd written five historical novels um, and, you know, three of them were set in Jamaica. So I'd gone out to Jamaica and stayed with some relatives there and things like that. So I, I knew that worked. Um, but I think it was, I was, it was just beginning to think about Wolf Brother and I, I went on, I had a choice of, I was trying to find somewhere to go on holiday. Um, and I had a choice of, I wanted a riding holiday. And I thought, well, it'll either be out of Mongolia or it'll be Lapland. And uh, Mongolia seemed quite a long way to go. So I thought, well, I'll just go to Lapland. And then a few months later, before I went to Lapland, um, I, I had the idea for Wolf Brother. So that was kind of luck, really. Um, and then as I was I was riding along in, in Lapland and sort of northern Finland, of course, I had was getting loads of ideas because it was at that lovely stage when, you know, you haven't written anything yet, but you're just thinking, oh, this, that and the other. And actually some things, there's still some things, one or two things that I can remember from that trip. I mean, they only came in in book six, you know, that there were little white moths that um, are quite scary, I think, in, in um, Ghost Hunter. That I had, I saw them, you know, on that trip. So, and on that trip, while I was sitting on a horse, thinking about Torak and, and Wolf. That's why I sort of devised what the clans would be like, each of the different clans. Um, so it was such a useful trip that I think I, I then realised, oh, okay, i got to do this some more, you know. Just a few more seconds. Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right. Well, let's, let's allow um, Kieran one then. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 so the bear story that inspired you when you lived in Canada. Yeah. Uh, I know Charlie wanted to hear like your version of it. Well, I wasn't actually living in Canada. I was actually visiting um, Southern California and I was walking, um, hiking in the mountains, something aptly named the Paradise Valley Trail because it nearly ended up being <laughs> paradise, um, swiftly sent off to heaven because I met a, a black bear and two cubs. And she got she got very um, well. She, I was basically too close to her. I didn't realize I didn't see them, and uh, so she came towards me to sort of check me out and, and sort of warded her own cubs back. And she she didn't like me very much. So she was sort of you know bears if they want to threaten you they can they click their jaws together, but it's a lot louder than that because they're bears. And um, <laughs> it was terrifying. It was terrifying. I mean, it, it just, everything went white for a minute. I just was so scared. But I managed, I did actually sing her, sing to her. You know, I was trying to sort of tell her I was there and calm her down. Um, I, I'm speeding this up. But, uh, you know, it, it seemed to go on for hours. And I just sort of talked to her calmly and then um, walked sideways. I didn't want to show her my back. I didn't want her to think I was running away. And she just sort of stood and looked at me. And I can still remember the way she looked at me. It's not nice when a large animal looks at you aggressively. And uh, But eventually I managed to get out of her line of sight and then I, I ran like crazy. Um, but it was terrifying. It was, it, was really, it was really terrifying. But afterwards, I was absolutely exhilarated. And when I finally got back to this funny little place, I was staying, little lodge I was staying in, I, I went to the bar. I never do that normally when I'm on my own. I just, but I went to the bar and I had the best supper ever. It was a massive bowl of coffee ice cream with a large whiskey. And <clears throat> it was brilliant. I thought, oh, I've survived. <laughs> um, but it was, yeah, it was really frightening. But even then, as I was sort of running down the mountain, I remember thinking I could have been in the Stone Age. You know, there was, it was just that simple, person, bear, you know, yeah. and I need to use some skills to get myself out of this situation because otherwise I'm going to die. She doesn't need to even attack me properly. She just needs to hit me once and she'd break my neck. Um, so it was, it was completely terrifying. But I do remember thinking, yeah, I probably in the Stone Age they would have, well, they would have known the bear was there. You know, they would have had more skills. Um, Torak wouldn't have got himself in that mess. But, uh, yeah, I'm really glad now that I had that experience. <laughs> you know, I know what mortal terror is like. I've actually experienced it. 
I don't want to experience it again, but uh, <laughs> as a writer, it's great that I have, you know, um, fantastic. So on that slightly sobering note, um, I guess we'd better, you know, I've got a, a stack of questions from other people, but um, do stick around and, and if anything strikes you, um, you know, do, do chime in, but not a bear, no, no. But thank you so much for getting in touch, firstly, Kieran, who was the instigator of all this. So great to talk to both of you. Um, you're a total inspiration. I think it's really heartwarming. I won't get too soppy, but it's lovely. Um, and have a, have a great Christmas. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank Merry you so Christmas. Much. Thank you, thank you. Right, well, how to follow that? Well, thankfully we've got some amazing questions. Um, Ah, yes. The first one is from Julie, um, who actually bought Thin Air in Heathrow um, and thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, and actually visited the Himalayan Mountain Institute. And I did some research there. Um, I think I got the idea for the Kang Ling, you know, the, the thigh bone trumpet. I think there's one in the Himalayan Mountain Institute. Um, so that was lovely. Thank you for getting in touch. Am I turning over to it once? Yes, I am. Now we have one from Ethan. Um, yes, careful, we have to, no spoilers here. You want to know if Wolf shows up in every single one of the books or just in the first one. Ethan, I don't often get very definite about things, but 100% Wolf is in every one of the Chronicles of Ancient Darkness. I can go further than that. If I ever write a sequel, and I will, I do, Wolf will be in that too. So there you are. That's as definite as you can possibly get. Now, here's a really interesting one from Emily, Hadia, and Elise, uh, British International School of Stavanger, who obviously have an amazing teacher. Um, you've been looking at Wolf Brother, and the question you're asking is, why do you think some heroes risk their lives for others? And that's such a huge, amazing question. Nobody can really give a complete answer. And I've had to think about that a lot, actually. Um, I mean, I think you have to care tremendously and love whatever it is you're prepared to risk your life for. The obvious example would be a, a parent for their child. Um, when you think about it in Wolf Brother, that's exactly what Far does for Torak because he's lying there. He knows he's dying, but he knows the bear's around somewhere. And so he tells Torak to get away, leaving himself as a decoy. Um, so you've got to really love somebody or something in order to risk your life for them. My grandfather did in the Second World War because he was in the resistance um, and he risked his life every day uh, but he basically took the view I think that you know what's the alternative you know um, the Nazis um, I, I also think though that risk probably means more when you get older um, I mean there's a bit in Wolf Brother again that uh, when Torak risks his life to go out into the blizzard and find Wren but Torak's 12 so at that age, you know, you, you sort of think you're going to live forever. So you take same risks. And, um, and I think when you get a bit older, perhaps it's, it's harder, but therefore even more heroic to take a risk. That's just touching on it. It's a huge question. Um, I think it's fascinating. And again, what a great teacher you've got to be asking those sort of enormous questions. I think that's wonderful. Now we are moving on to Elias, I hope I get your name right, again, from Sweden. Um, and two questions and a recommendation. The first question, yes, you're looking at the clothes of people in Chronicles. Um, well, I think, I mean, you're not going to get very far with studying Stone Age clothes, but, you know, there's some sort of remains and things. The way I've done it is I've looked at more traditional people like the Sami. I think you, you've obviously got a Sami grandmother or someone who knows about uh, clothes. Um, and uh, the Inuit, for example, um, Native Americans, if you look up books on them, their clothing should help you. If you'll just excuse me, I will just reach down and grab some books. I did look in my shelves, Elias. I'm not sure how whether you'd be able to find these. There's a lovely one called Traditional Dress by someone, this is Native American, by someone with a great name. He's called Adolf, knocked over the light anyway. There we go. Adolf Hungry Wolf. Um, and uh, hang about while I just grab the light. 
Um, there we go. Got that again. <laughs> Sorry. There's another one, though, which you might get hold of. It's called Arctic Clothing. Um, and it's by British Museum Publications. So it's Arctic Clothing. That might if you can that would be brilliant because that would give you a lot of information i also had sinews of survival um which is a great one the living legacy of inuit clothing but it's the university of british columbia press and these are all a few years old so i, I don't know about that um you also and if you've got a sami grandmother or a grandmother who knows about stuff then that's pretty useful as well, Elias. That'll stand you in a long, good stead. You also had a question about, um, yeah, c can thin air be made into an audio book? It has been. Yes, it most definitely has been. Here we are. Here is the, the very thing. Um, this is, it's read brilliantly by um, Daniel Neyman, um, Wayman, sorry. I was there in the, in the studio. It's wonderful. And according to the thing I've got here, it's oh, it's contains both MP3 and M4B files. That probably means l much more to Kieran and Charlie and you, Elias, than to me. But yeah, it's definitely available. And I'd like to know if if you can't get hold of it. Um, and finally, you've got a lovely recommendation of an artist whom I hadn't heard of called Tom Birkland, who does the most really gorgeous, as you say, evocative pictures of how people might have looked in the Stone Age, you know, and using, again, he's obviously based it a lot on traditional um, hunter-gatherers and how they dress. And I love it. You know, look, that could be Torek, as you say. Um, they're just gorgeous. Um, and they look like real people. As, as I think Elias says, they look like people you could meet walking down the street. You know, they do. And so thank you for that recommendation. Um, and you sign off by saying, thank you so much for your wonderful books that have brought me much joy and a fair bit of fright. <laughs> Excellent. I'm so pleased. Thank you. Um, now we're moving on to Anne, um, Anne Kanakaris. Uh, oh, you've loved these books for 12 years. That's fantastic. Um, and this is interesting, yes, because we're talking about, you know, it's a non-patriarchal society and they respect nature. And the question is an interesting one. My question is, what would Torak think about our 21st century? Um, yeah, that's a tricky one. I don't know if he'd be very positive um, about it. That's what Anne says. Is there anything he would like about it? Well, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about it. I mean, there's lots he wouldn't like about it. I think we can all think of that. I mean, you know, too much noise. He'd hate cars, trees, too many people. You know, he finds he finds a clan gathering quite hard work because he's grew up on his own so he, he would hate all the people um but i think there are things he would quite like um i think painkillers you know medicines and painkillers i don't think anybody could object to painkillers um if ren ever has a baby you know childbirth is a heck of a lot less painful if you're in a hospital i think than in you know if you're lying in um in a shelter Glasses and contact lenses. I'm trying to be positive here. Um, an electric torch. I think he might think that was quite useful. Um, although, having said that, it's you know if you're out in the dark, it's better to try to get your eyes to adapt. And sweets, chocolates, marshmallows. <laughs> Even men are quite young, but um, I think that they quite like those. But um, I'm grasping at straws here, as you can probably tell. I think there's an awful lot he wouldn't like very much. Um, great question, that. Now, moving on to Elue. I hope I've got that right. Um, oh, yes. Can I insist to my editors to translate the books into Spanish? You had to wait a long time for Wolf Brother, I know, and all the Wolf Brother books. And now they're being a bit slow with, with Gods and Warriors. I'm afraid I can't really insist. Um, it's not up to me. And some countries just take you know, longer than others, and some of them sort of don't translate the whole series or whatever. Sorry about that, Eloy. I, I hope they speed up. Next one, we have one from one of my ex-colleagues when I was a lawyer, from John, John Rimmer. Hello, John. Um, you've asked, um, when we worked together, yes, you're absolutely right, I did love the, the Norse sagas. What books inspire and excite me now? Um, 
I think what happens to me now is that I don't really get inspiration from the books, but it, except in terms of style, I, I notice how they tell the stories. And I've been reading a lot of Anthony Trollope and a uh, 19th century novelist, but incredibly good at changing scenes without you already noticing that you've moved from one scene to another, keeping the interest going, keeping you turning the pages. I'm finding the 19th century novelists um, very, very inspiring in terms of how to tell a story. Um, moving on to Tracy. Uh, yes. Now, your daughter, um, you're a teacher, and you're feeding Tracy, your, your daughter books, and she's my books have inspired her to, to write, which is brilliant. And the question is, do I sign books at all? Because, um, they, yes, they probably would make a nice present. I'm afraid I don't, you know, through the internet or send them out posted or something. It's just a question of if I'm doing an event and if you come along to that event, then I will sign the books. Um, I have to say I haven't got any events scheduled at the moment because I haven't been doing any for the last year or so. So I'm afraid that's kind of a no, but just keep an eye on my website, michellepaver.com, in case, you know, um, I start doing events again. Um, now, moving on to Edward. Oh, yes. Now, these are some detailed questions. Um, these are great because Edward has read Chronicles of Ancient Darkness and then... When he found out about gods and warriors, he then reread and enjoyed gods and gods and warriors. Um, skipping down to two, yes, the, the two questions. They're quite detailed. Um, and Edward, we we did sorry, we edit, edited them a little bit just to cut out the spoilers. They weren't big ones, but how was Tenris able to conceal his true identity as a seal mage? Um, you could reason that you know. His conspicuous scars might arouse suspicion. Well, I think the thing you have to remember there, I have not a problem with that because um, in those days, you know, people, news didn't travel that fast and people didn't stray that far from, you know, where they where they lived, particularly the SEAL clan. You know, some of the clans obviously are, are nomadic, but um, the SEAL clan, are, are they stay on their island and maybe once or twice they'll come over to the coast or something to, you know, some of them to trade. But remember, you know, it's only a few decades since people in England might not travel their whole lives to the next village. Um, some of them did, but some of them didn't. So um, it would be quite easy for in, in the Stone Age world to conceal your identity. Um, the second question, this is um, about uh, the walker, uh, when he says Neff stole his stone claw, leaving him without fire. Do you reckon if the theft saw the two interact, um, the Bat Mage would have arrested him? Um, I actually think it was probably Seshru who stole the stone claw because the, the walker, I had to I had to go and look this up actually, but uh, the walker says the sideways one and I've always thought that was Seshru, but doesn't that doesn't matter for the purpose of your question. Um, I don't think that's a problem because um, Neff or, or, or Seshru, you know, they wouldn't have seen the person they knew before. I'm trying not to give a spoiler. Um, uh, the walker was pretty good at concealing his identity you know he's not completely mad and for him to have survived this long he has concealed his identity pretty well so the answer is no that's not a problem um the other one is also an interesting one and and if so you know if 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 whoever it was stole the stone claw did recognize um the walker why didn't aestra learn of it um, and I'm, again, not going to go into the details of your question because of a spoiler, but why didn't Aostra learn of it in book six? Well, because there's no honour between among thieves and the soul eaters don't give each other information. They don't tell each other everything, you know, because they're always on the lookout of how to how can they get one up on the others. So, um, in fact, I would I would have loved to have, ti have had time in those books for them to sort of fall out among each other and double cross each other because they were always doing that. But... You know, um, I had to move the story along. Those are those are great questions, and in fact, a couple of them were ones that were asked and answered uh, by with my editor during the, the writing of the book. So you <laughs> you should be an editor, basically. You've got the instincts of one. I hope that helps anyway. 
Um, moving on to uh, Caroline, Caroline Fielding, you're a teacher in uh, in London. Oh yes, you've got this great scenario um, for the, your students, and you're basically asking me to send an email, which I think my agent has done. Um, the setting setting the students um, a uh, a task: design a new book cover for Wolf Brother, um, and. Uh, my agent set out the, the things that you need, you know, to, to think about Torak, Wren and Wolf. The title is Wolf Brother. I think the one thing I would add um, is somehow getting across an atmosphere of the Stone Age, which is really difficult. But um, if you could do that, that would be brilliant. And I think what we'd love is as and when your, your pupils come up with some covers, if you feel like posting them, you know, we'd love to show them on the on the next um michelle paler life so but good luck and please take this um as a request for new book covers for wolf brother as a as an assignment for your pupils thank you um oh and here's another picture in, from elsa i think elsa asked me a question about calendars um did, did i have a sort of calendar uh, of of in torax world and she's come up with one so um it's uh, hugely detailed and really wonderful. We've got ravens, we've got deer, we've got wolf, of course. Um, we've got dark fur. And then the calendar's been worked out and uh, that must have taken you ages. It's brilliant. So thank you for sharing that. And um, ah, yes, now we have one from Terry. And I think this is the same as one that Terry sent in at the end of October. So... It's a writing question. I hope, Terry, actually, I know I've answered that before. Um, I hope you saw that. But if for some reason you didn't, um, you're a novice writer, you just want some top tips. At the risk of sounding like an English teacher, which is no bad thing, rewriting, rewriting is the top tip of all. Um, whatever you've written, you know, put it away for a bit and then come back to it and look at it critically. You know, how can I make it clearer? How can I speed it up? How can I, the, above all, how can I keep the reader's interest? Um, there's loads you can do with rewriting, moving things around. Uh, good books aren't written, they're rewritten. And that's very true. And the second thing I would say um, in these days um, is put your phone away, mute the internet or however you can do it, you know, just make sure that you don't get emails and messages pinging onto your screen when you're writing because that is going to take you out of whatever we're in um, and that's really important um, I mean I'm talking to you from my my spare room this is not where I write where I write I was telling Kieran and Charlie it's it's an 18 year old 19 year old computer downstairs and oof, you know it doesn't even have a disk drive anymore that died a few months ago so there's no way the internet can, can reach me and my phone is silent so try to isolate yourself a little bit even if just for a few hours and that will help your concentration tremendously so i hope you get that one terry um moving along jose luis i hope i pronounced that right right um this is great um because you're writing very, very well in, in English, um, José Luis. Um, you want to understand why I don't make a seventh book of Chronicles of Prehistory. Um, and I, we've just slightly edited it for spoiler. And then you've given us an idea. It's basically the Soul Eaters' spirits have escaped um, and then they come back to menace Torek and Wren and Wolf. Um, so great idea, even better English. Well, the idea of a seventh book, you know, it's it's one I, other people have asked. Um, I've always said, you know, if I get a really good idea, maybe, because these characters haven't left me. Um, they haven't left some of you either from the sound of it. So, fingers crossed, maybe, maybe I will. Now then, let's move on to, we've got a few more to go. Uh, Karen um, is asking... She's just said some very nice things about the books and like to ask where you get your inspiration from, because I have a hard time thinking of ideas for my stories. Yeah. Now, well, the short answer is I don't know. You know, the mind is a really mysterious place. I wish I did know because I don't get ideas very often. Um, but when they do, I know it. Um, 
So, and then I can look back and think, well, where did I get that idea? Sometimes it's from a place. Uh, sometimes it's from watching a bit of television, a documentary or something, and something mm. that an animal does. The last book I, 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 I've written, I've almost finished, um, I got an idea when I went to an exhibition of paintings, very strange paintings. And um, I asked my mother, I said, what, what do you think that's the artist was trying to, was feeling when he painted that. And she just said, fear. <laughs> That's all she said. Um, and that gave me an, an idea for a story. So it's lots of things. Um, I, I would just say a suggestion is take a little notebook with you when you're on your way to school or, or you know, um, have one by your bed. And if anything strikes you, a bit of dialogue or something, just write it down. It might spark a story. Um, I realise I'm not being much help, but that's because it's it's a very mysterious thing. Most authors don't know where they get their ideas from. You know, afterwards you can look at Wolf Brother and say, "Oh yes, I remember. I met that bear. You remember I was talking to to Kieran and Charlie about that." But you know, that's looking back. It's it's sort of it's a very mysterious thing. But good luck, and I hope you actually do um, get some ideas. And I think that's pretty much it. I think we've now reached the end. Have we reached the end? Yes. I think we've got to the end of the... On to the questions. Well, thank you so much for asking really brilliant questions. Um, you, you always do. You, you, you've got a great line in imaginative and critical questions. Um, so finally, I've just got a couple of recommendations. Uh, we're getting into the sort of holiday season. So who is the man that um, you just saw on, on the screen? That was James Thurber, just reaching down. This is a brilliant book. It's called The Thirteen Clocks. Um, it's kind of a fair, it is a fairy story. Whether you're nine or 90, this is a book worth reading. It's got the most amazing style. It's lovely to read out loud. I'll just read you. It's about a, a cold duke who's murdered time and he's got 13 clocks and he's got a wonderful niece. I think she's a niece and lots of suitors come and, and he sets after the, the niece and he sets all sorts of tasks. Um, and the style is brilliant. He's got all these clocks. The clocks were dead and in the end, brooding on it, the duke decided he had murdered time slain it with his sword and wiped his bloody blade upon its beard and left it lying there, bleeding hours and minutes, its springs uncoiled and sprawling, its pendulum disintegrating. And so it goes on. It's brilliant. It's absolutely, it's a really fun read, but also beautiful and, and poetic. So it just might be fun. Who's just feeling a bit tired after exams or mocks or whatever. Um, great fun. And then the other thing is... It's available on DVD, but you can probably download it. It's a, a it's a vampire film, nothing like Twilight. This is Nosferatu, the vampire. Yes, it's got the most beautiful. Let's, we're getting some shots there. It's in German. Um, this is, I mean, there are two versions. There's one in 1921, which is a silent one, which is brilliant. But um, this is the, the, I think it was 1971 or 79, I can't remember. And there's the vampire. It's really beautiful, directed by Werner Herzog, um, as I say, available on DVD, I think. Um, and it's got a strange atmosphere, it's just a wonderful atmosphere, brilliant use of music, some classical, some not, um, beautifully acted. And don't worry about the subtitles, it's just sink into the atmosphere and enjoy. Yes, there we are. He's uh, He's quite something Klaus Kinski as the vampire so those are a couple of recommendations the 13 clocks and Nosferatu the vampire so I think actually that's all we've got time for um, if, we, if I've run over time just blame yourselves for all those wonderful questions and um, thanks very much special thanks to uh, Kieran and Charlie um, for, for being with us um, oh, yes. In terms of questions and comments, um, please, please, the best way to get in touch with me, because I think, you know, I'm, I'm rubbish at sort of getting back to you on posts and Twitter and things like that, because I'm too busy writing. So um, the best way to get in touch is go to my website, michellepaver.com, and click on Ask. 
uh, the ask button and then fill in the form with your questions or comments and that will get to me then that's the best way of getting to me and i will answer them in the next michelle paver live um and if you want to send a video you can even mm -hmm. video your questions uh there is room to do that too i mean that would be quite fun if we could um answer your questions or video um you can of course also follow my updates updates on twitter that's at twitter.com slash michelle paver and here on facebook um, i'm gonna have to read this bit facebook.com slash michelle paver author um if you haven't been able to catch that all of that uh, plus my YouTube channel and my mailing list. It, it's all on my website. So the only thing you have to really remember is michellepaver.com. So um, it just remains for me to say thank you, everyone who sent in comments and questions. Thank you, Kieran and Charlie. And whatever you're up to over the holiday period, um, whether you're seeing friends or family or just curling up with a good book and ignoring the whole festive season, I hope you have a lovely, relaxing time. Bye-bye.